Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> if you could just turn to your neighbors and with life, could you uh, welcome each other? Could you do that? Turn to your neighbors and welcome each other. <clears throat> Today we begin our new series uh, on Galatians, uh, something we've been announcing and praying for. Um, if you could just look up here, please. I would appreciate that. Yeah. And this is a book uh, that really highlighted history. Okay. And I hope this kind of intrigues you. Okay. And the title of today's message, uh, the first message of Galatians, is Christian Righteousness. What word do you see in that word, righteousness? Right, right. And here's a question for you. Can a mortal man be right before God? Can a mortal man be right before, uh, before, before God? You're going to stand before the Lord. You will. There's no way out, people. All of us will stand before the Lord. And will you be right with him? That's the question that Job uh, rhetorically asked in uh, Job chapter 4. Can a mortal man be right before God? It's a trembling thought if you think about it. If you are serious about this question. Can a mortal man be pure before the maker? Pure before holiness of God? Do you know what that is? Can I just ask you, how pure is he? How holy is he? And the right answer, right theological answer would be infinitely holy. Infinitely holy. Okay? So, <clears throat> just want to begin with that question. And uh, the book of Galatians is known as the uh, charter or the declaration of freedom. Are you free or do you feel... With, with guilty conscience. You're always like guilty. Okay? Or Galatian has been called in history the Magna Carta or the, the big path of spiritual liberty or freedom. Okay? Or the Declaration of Independence for Christians. Have you experienced freedom in Christ or are you, do you feel with guilty? Do you live with guilty guilt? It's a real question, isn't it? Galatians has been attributed as the uh, battle cry of the 16th century Protestant Reformation, which is like the high, high note mark in Christian history. Okay, as Martin Luther lectured and wrote uh, a, a commentary on Book of Galatians. This is something that has changed his life. Martin Luther is the father of Reformation, of course. As you know, he's an Augustinian monk who tried to live a righteous life because as an ex-law uh, student, he knew the justice of God. He thought about justice of God, the righteousness of God. And he wanted to be a good Christian and to be righteous before the Lord as you probably are doing as well. Yet, if you read his story, it's so interesting because he was a monk and he was really trying. He was doing everything that he's supposed to do. And yet he was always in terror when he think about the judgment of God and the wrath of God. Okay? When you think about the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Okay? Isn't it interesting? He lived so much more religious, so much more pious, so much more holy than all of us put together. And yet he was always in terror. And he was always in just agony of his soul. Bottom line is he did not understand the gospel. He did not understand the gospel. The gospel of grace. But breakthrough came when he discovered that, listen to this carefully because you may or may not know this. 
He discovered that Christian is, Christianity is not so much about what I do for God, but Christianity is really about what God has done for me. Do you know this? I really want to ask you, because you may not know this. Let me repeat that because I, th I think it is worth repeating. His breakthrough, which brought a breakthrough in Christian history, came when he realized that Christian gospel is not what you do for God, but it is really about what God has done for me. Do you see the difference? Do, I hope you hear the difference. Okay, so what does he teach? Okay, let me go to <clears throat> a little bit of uh, what Martin Luther wrote in Introduction to Galatians, uh, his, his commentary. And if you could just pay attention to this, this is going to be an, I think, electrifying thing if you never knew this. Electrifying thing. I read it this week, this whole um, introduction more than five times. Uh, I'm going to send it to you right after this service because you would want to read it. Okay? Just let me read the summary. But this most excellent righteousness before God that God receives, of faith, I mean, which God, through Christ, without works, imputed unto us, is neither political, ceremonial, or the righteousness of God's law, nor consists in our works, but it is opposite. It is contrary, clean contrary. It is the opposite of what you think it is. Okay? It is contrary, opposite, that is to say, a mere passive righteousness. What he's saying is, Everything we try to do, do we live right before the Lord, do right things, right ceremony, good things, offset bad things, all of these are active. But Christian righteousness is not active, it's passive. Okay? Passive righteousness, as the other above are active. For in this, we work nothing. Did you know that? We work nothing. We render nothing to God, but only we receive. That is the faith that you are saved by. You work nothing, you render nothing to God. Because if you do, you're going to ruin it. Okay? I'm going to explain it later. So this is what uh, Martin Luther kind of, he, it just changed his whole, whole life and changed, changed the course of Christian history, this thought, okay? We only, we receive and suffer another to work in us, that is to say, God, God has done it for us, okay? God has done it for us. Therefore, it seems good unto me to call this righteousness of faith or justification by faith, Christian righteousness, okay? That's the gospel righteousness. That's the righteousness you and I need to stand before God with, okay? Christian righteousness, passive righteousness. Luther continues, that is to say, mere passive righteousness, for in this we work nothing. I'm, I'm repeating, nothing, people, because if you move, you're going to ruin it. Okay? And we render nothing unto God, but only we receive and suffer another to work in us. That is to say, God, God to work in us. You know what faith is? Faith is a miracle of God in you. Because you, you don't think like that. You do not like to trust. Our nature wants to be autonomous. That's sin nature. We do not want to trust. We always want to count my goods my achievement, what I have done. It's contrary. So faith really is a miracle of God that God gives you and I as a gift. It's a divine miracle. If you have faith, praise be to God. If you don't, I pray that you will be seeking. Okay? 
Therefore, it seems good to me to call this righteousness or the righteous uh, justification by faith as Christian righteousness, which is passive righteousness. It's an amazing summary, amazing summary. And we're going to go back to this again and again and again. And I hope at your last breath, as Martin Luther introduces, you would not be counting what you have done before the Lord. Oh, I, I was pretty good. I went to church pretty much all my life, except my college years, my wild years, except my young adult years, except raising my children years. I went to church pretty much all my life. And I was pretty good. I was, I was part of the Sunday school team, and I was part of the choir. And I gave pretty consistently. You, you will, like, the day that you're dying, can you imagine you're thinking about that? And in a minute, any moment, you'll be standing before the Lord. Any moment, you'll be standing before the Lord. And you're, you're counting your achievement, your work. Martin Luther says, if you do that, it's going to bring terror in you. You're going to be so anxious before you die. And you'll be terrified. Right? And only other option that you have, which is the true Christian righteousness, is the righteousness of Christ given unto me. And I have done nothing. I render nothing. All I had done was receive. That's Christian righteousness. Okay, uh, such a liberating power. I'm not sure whether you experienced this. Martin Luther, it took him a while to understand this. A while have you come to that place. About 100 years later, a uh, great Puritan preacher named John Bunyan, and some of you know that name. He is the author of Pilgrim's Progress, and he wrote his autobiography titled Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And Mr. Bunyan, uh, John Bunyan, got hold of this old copy of Luther's Commentary on Galatians. How do you like that? Okay. Co hundred years later. So he wrote in that autobiography uh, that I was surprised how old this book was. And I was even more surprised when I read it. And this is what he wrote. Mr. Bunyan. Okay reading Luther's commentary. I find my condition in his experience so largely and profoundly handled as if his book had been written out of my heart, out of my heart. His anxiety, his fear, his terror before the judgment of God and the wrath of God was just like Martin Luther. John Bunyan had that. And then he wrote, I do prefer this book of Mr. Luther's upon Galatians, accepting, uh, except the Holy Bible, before all the other books that I have ever seen. Such liberating power, isn't it? One more story. About 50 years later, after John Bunyan, 1730 in England, and I uh, forgot the name of the group, but this group, who was seeking God, led by Charles Wesley and John Wesley. Okay. And you know, uh, through them with George Whitfield, uh, uh, historic, a great awakening happened, great awakening happened uh, between America as well as Europe and England. And uh, there was a record as this little group, led by John Wesley and Charles Wesley brothers, was uh, they were seeking God, and one night a breakthrough came to them. Okay, a breakthrough came to them when a man named William Holland got hold of guess what Luther's Galatians commentary. Okay, and in the very beginning of Luther's commentary on Galatians, there is a pref uh, pre preface and an introduction, which I'm gonna uh, send it to you right after this worship service. And uh, he got hold of that, and William Holland brought it to Charles Wesley and said, hey, let's read, read this together. Let's read it to one another. So two of them and a few others got together, and they began to read this introduction to Galatians by Martin Luther 150 years later. William Holland later on wrote down what happened 
that night, and this is what he wrote. He wrote, Mr. Charles Wesley read the uh, pre preface or uh, introduction loud. At a certain point, he said, there came a such a power over me as I cannot well describe. My great burden fell off in an instant in my heart was so filled with peace and love that I burst into tears. This is Charles Wesley. I almost thought I saw our Savior. My companions, perceiving me so affected, fell on their knees and prayed. When afterward, when into the street, could scarcely felt the ground that I trod upon. Amazing, amazing people. A turning point and breakthrough upon Charles Wesley's life, John Bunyan's life, Martin Luther's life. It came through the Gospel of Galatians. And I'm, I'm just asking you, have you experienced that kind of breakthrough in your life? Or is your Christianity boring? Not that important. And I'm praying that the Spirit of God would stir your heart as you're listening to this history that God has performed. William Holland took Luther's commentary on Galatians every night to somebody's house and sat down and said, let's read this together. Let's read this together. Galatians, according to Keller, is a bomb. It's a bomb. Personally, the gospel was open to me through to my life through Galatians, personally. Chapter 3 and chapter 4 is amazing. Okay? Let's begin the uh, exposition of Galatians chapter 1. It's only made up of 148 verses. You could read this in less than 20 minutes. I've been reading it for the last several months. Probably read over 50 times. It's not that long. But it is rich and it is powerful and it is strong message of the gospel and Christian righteousness that you and I need to have in order to be right with God. Okay? So, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm just going to explain two verses today. Okay? I was going to try for five verses, but I couldn't. Still have 18 pages of notes today. So, Paul, an apostle... Not from men, no through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches at Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I don't know whether you read this kind of introduction or salutation. Normally, you kind of skim through it, right? If you be honest. It just doesn't look that important. But this particular uh, introduction is different, as you probably sense. Okay, let me explain. In an ancient letter like this, this is a letter, and Paul wrote... 13 letters in the New Testament. In ancient letters, the author's name and his credential comes first. Okay, as you see, Paul. What is his credential? An apostle. And you're like, oh, of course, he's an apostle. But this word uh, in the beginning of the book of Galatians is, is a, such an important statement. Okay? His credential is an apostle. And then he goes on to explain, not from men nor through men. He's really saying, my apostleship, apostolos, is not man origin, but it is God origin. He's saying, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised from the dead. Okay, so first thing he's establishing is, this, that's, that's his credential. I'm an apostle, apostolos, not by men, but through God and God alone. Why is that important? Because... If he's a messenger of men, his word and his gospel is man's word. But if he's a 
messenger or apostolos of God or divine, his word, Paul's word, is the gospel from, from God himself. Do you see the difference? Okay. Here's the opening. You could sense that Paul is kind of like, kind of like upset. The letter uh, opens with more argumentation than greeting or salutation. You could sense it. Hey, Paul, Apostle Paul, not from men through men. It just sounds very offensive. Okay? And but through Jesus Christ, God the Father. So what is he upset about? If you read the whole book of Galatians, it is not very difficult to kind of discern that. Two things. Number one, his opponents were basically attacking his apostleship and authority. You're a fake. You're a second class. You're not one of the 12 disciples. Who are you, Paul? I know Paul. I know John. But who are you? It's that kind of thing. And the second thing, that he's upset about is because his opponents will basically say, see, you're a fake, you're a second-class uh, uh, you know, apostle, so your word and your gospel is off. That's not enough. That's not enough. Two things, authority of his apostleship and his gospel. What is an apostle? Uh, to the Jews, it was very well-defined. It meant a special messenger with a special status, with the authority or the commission that uh, came from a king or a higher authority. In other words, when he said, I'm a messenger of Jesus and God, then I'm God's messenger. In other words, what I am delivering to you is God's word. Can I just ask you, when you listen to this message, I know you look at Pastor Paul Chung, but there is a sense in which when I preach by God's uh, commission, and faithful to the Word of God, relying upon the Holy Spirit, and I deliver the Word of God to you, God is speaking to you. Because this is God's Word, written by apostolos of God Himself. Okay? The messenger or the apostle had the authority to represent his superior or the king, uh, sort of like an agent who holds the power of attorney uh, this day and age. But in the New Testament, the term apostle has more specific meaning. It denotes an official spokesman for Jesus, especially the 12 disciples. You know the 12 disciples who Jesus lived and walked and discipled for three years. But his original 12 disciple plus Paul, who have seen the risen Lord, we specifically call them apostles. Listen to me this. Listen, uh, listen to this. Who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the New Testament? It's the apostles. It's not the church, like the Rome is telling us. Their argument is these are all, you know, Christians who belong to the church, so the church wrote the Bible, and their argument is that because the church wrote, uh, church wrote the Bible, church has the higher authority than the scripture. Not true. That is not the case. Paul was an apostle of Christ, not apostle of church. If you read the Bible carefully, it does not say that. An entire New Testament was written by uh, the apostles, either one of the twelve or Paul himself. And they are not apostles of the church, but they are apostles of Christ. Do you see the difference? It sounds the same, but it's a huge difference. Luke chapter 6, verse 13, when Jesus starting out his ministry after he prayed all night, this is how he appointed or commissioned apostles. Luke 6, 13. When the day came, okay, the morning came, Jesus called his disciples and chose from the twelve whom he named apostles. Apostles. These are the men who were chosen, called, and commissioned by Jesus himself to speak his word. And Paul is saying, I am an apostle of Christ. Okay? Paul's opponents were, critics were basically pointing out that Paul was not one of the twelve. And he came later, and so they claim that you are kind of like a second, you're a latecomer. You are a second class uh, apostle and the gospel that you are teaching is not enough. 
Do you see what's going on? Do you see why Paul is upset? Basically, their opponents warn, uh, one saying that, uh, you know, what Paul starts the letter and defending his, he's not really defending his credentials. He's really defending the gospel, salvation by grace and grace alone. That's what is at stake. In other words, his teaching, his gospel, his theology is off because you are not true apostle. And, you know, they were devaluing, discredit Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace by faith in Christ alone, which is what we now call justification by faith. And that's the Christian gospel. If they could show that he was an imposter rather than an apostle, they could disregard this message of gospel of grace. What do you believe? Do you realize this attack continues throughout history? Definitely in 21st century. What gospel do you believe? Do you believe that active righteousness, that you need to perform something, you need to add something, you need to subtract something? Or do you believe that passive Christian righteousness of justification by faith and faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. What do you believe? You have to. You have to think about it. The reason I say that is this. Everybody has theology. Did you know that? Now, if you could just look up here. People, sometimes, like people who believe in this uh, cultic religion, they put water in front of a tree and they bow before, uh, before the tree like 50 times every single day. What are they doing? They believe if they do that, that performance, that their God will bless them. That's theology. Is that a right theology according to the scripture? Absolutely wrong. But my point being, he has theology. How many of you do believe that God is here today? Some of you, I hope most of you believe, all of you believe, but some of you say, I'm not sure about that. That's your theology. We all have theology. But what I'm trying to, make, uh, uh, what I'm trying to explain is, based on the right theology, right life stance. Does that make sense? People say, I could worship God during this pandemic and stay home. And hey, you know what? It's kind of comfortable. Hey, ba and, and besides, I feel more blessed. I'm all alone with the Lord, so it, it feels better to worship God through a uh, live stream. That's their theology. Wrong theology. Does that make sense? We all have theology. You may be believing wrong theology about salvation. You know what devil does? You know what the enemy does throughout history? He doesn't attack the church from the outside of the church, although he does, but the true challenge is the devil distort the truth, perhaps slightly, in your mind. And these people who are preaching distorted gospel that we will see in Galatians, they use the word Jesus, cross, Holy Spirit, everything. But only difference is they always add or subtract something from Je what Jesus has done. It's not passive righteousness. It's always active righteousness. But that's not Christian righteousness. Does that make sense? 20, in 21st century, I pray that you'll be able to discern. Am I standing right before the Lord? Based on what? You must ask that question. Based on what? Okay, so I'm going back to uh, this teaching. So what was at stake? It was not just Paul's name or credential, but our gospel and our salvation. You believe in wrong, uh, a wrong gospel, you are, there is no salvation. That's why Paul is so upset, and that's why this book made such difference throughout Christian history. Protestant Reformation. Come on, people of God. Are you listening to this? John Bunyan and uh, Charles Wesley and John Wesley. Even right now, it really is about the truth fight. At the end, it's the truth fight. What do you believe? You say, probably think, if I do this, that will be enough. Is that your theology? Is that enough? 
I think the more I think about what Ruther was doing, right before you die, you're going to be counting how well I did with my life? Did I offset with all these garbage that I lived? Is that what you're going to be thinking about? Guess what's going to happen to your soul? Martin Luther is saying, devil will bring a terror in you, anxiety in you. And that's how you're going to end your life. Okay, let me just move on. Uh, <clears throat> was Paul's calling as an apostle legitimate? Was he an apostle of Christ? And if you read Acts chapter 9, uh, and I, I love this chapter. If you read Book of Acts, which is the history of the, uh, uh, the first church, it just kind of like sticks out. Chapter 9 is like random. It just doesn't feel like it belongs to there. It's about one person's conversion. Saul becoming Paul. It's, it's pretty amazing. The gospel going forth all throughout Judea, Samaria, and then Paul, and then Paul kind of takes over. It just feels highlighted, distinctive fashion. Who was Paul? His name was Saul, and basically he was a super conservative Pharisee, and he was the rising star of his, his, his cult. Basically, he was really, really uh, the next leader. And looking at Christianity as a cult, and he wanted to just eradicate and just genocide all of them, basically. And he had such a zeal. And if you remember, he was breathing out his murder, murderous threats, like a war horse. And on his way to Damascus with, with the soldiers to capture Christians and just, just to kill them. And while he was there, the risen Lord called him Saul. Saul, why are you forsaking, uh, why are you persecuting me? Saul, Saul. We know the story of Paul, which is totally by grace, isn't it? Did he do anything to deserve what, uh, to become what he, what he became? He was doing opposite. And yet, Lord called him, chosen him, and commissioned to him. To be, my, to be my chosen instrument to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to the kings. That's the grace. You know that story. And Paul, uh, for the next 35 years, he went all over the Roman Empire, basically entire Roman Empire, and preached the gospel for 35 years. And he went on to write 13 letters of the New, uh, of the New Testament. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Colossians and Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon. And I did a little uh, study this week. Out of 13 books, I just checked how he began his letter because I know that's an important thing. Eight out of 13, the way he starts is this. Paul, an apostle of God, by the will of God, who has been called to be an apostle. He specified that, 8 out of 13. You should go check, okay? Why is this fact so important? And we already talked about it. What is at stake? Paul's opponents were saying that gospel of grace is not enough. That's your word. That's not God's word. You need circumcision. You need to do this, okay? However, Paul is establishing that in the beginning of this letter, uh, his word and his gospel came straight from Christ because I'm an apostle of Christ. Are you listening? That's a very important thing. New Testament is apostolic. Christianity, God's Christian gospel standing upon apostles, prophets and uh, uh, apostles. New Testament is written by the apostles, not by the church, but by the apostles who had a direct revelation, direct teaching from God himself. So you need to believe in that. Okay. Anyone who set aside and deviates and adds and subtract this apostolic teaching, set aside the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who say it. It could be Billy Graham. It could be John Piper. It doesn't matter who say it. Anyone who deviates and adds and subtracts this apostolic teaching of the New Testament gospel deviates, set aside the gospel 
and the truth of Jesus Christ. Looking at verse 1, still in verse 1, who is Jesus that he is preaching about? He clearly says, I'm an apostle, not from men or through men. In other words, men. I'm not originated from men, but from God, using this one preposition, through Jesus and God the Father. What is he doing? He's basically saying, this man, Jesus Christ, is equal with God the Father. Basically, he's, he's, he's establishing that. Paul stated that through Jesus and God the Father, using just one preposition, through, dia, okay, through Jesus and God. Which means Jesus is God who came as a man. Paul is placing and place Jesus on the same plane as God. If you remember John's gospel, Jesus and God the Father are equal. Equal in nature, equal in attribute. And just to give you an example. God is holy. Jesus is holy. God is righteous. Jesus is righteous. God is compassionate, and Jesus is compassionate. It may sound weird to you. Equal in nature. That's why some famous theologians say, God was always like Jesus. Did you catch that? If you read the Gospels, you know how God always was. God was always like Jesus. Later in chapter 4, Paul says he was born of women, yet... Uh, he shares an essential and eternal unity with God the Father. Between them, there is no distinction of essence, equal in substance, and equal God. That's why he's worthy of his uh, substitutionary death for your, for your sin. If any men died for you on your behalf, that will not be enough. It had to be God, man, Jesus Christ. Martin Luther wrote, there is no other God than this man, Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? It's so funny. There is no other God than this man, Jesus. We must look at no other God than this incarnate and human God. Martin Luther. Does that make sense? Who is Jesus to you? What kind of gospel do you believe in? Okay. Only through this man, God, Jesus, that you could be saved. Philip Ryken said, Jesus was a man among men, yet he is very God of very God. Great theological statement. He was a man among men, but he was very God of very God. Okay, great, great theological statement. Secondly, Paul wrote in the beginning, Jesus the God-man whom, whom, whom God has raised from the dead. Christianity is about resurrection. Do you believe in resurrection? Even if you don't, you'll be resurrected, the Bible says. The only difference is there's going to be two different types of resurrection. Is in John's gospel. One is the resurrection of life. The other is res resurrection of judgment. Depends on your relationship, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact. It's not a myth. It's not what you think it is. It's writ written in well-documented in, his in, in historic documents all over the places, and it was witnessed, eyewitnessed by multiple eyewitnesses, including the believers and disciples and skeptics. And, and even at one point, Jesus, resurrected Jesus showed up in front of 500 people at the same time, written in, 1 Corinthians. Can I just ask you, do you believe in resurrection? You know what resurrection proves? Two things. We've been preaching this all along. Number one, Jesus is God. There's no one who came, who was birthed, who died, and who was resurrected and is still alive. He's God. The second thing is, Acts chapter 17, while well, Paul preached, resurrection proves that through this man, God will judge the living and the dead. So he's calling everyone to everyone, everyone in everywhere to repent. You need to repent. Your goal in life should not be just pursuing success. Your goal in life is not just buying a house. Your goal in life should not be just, I don't know, 
whatever. You know this is going to be the final destiny of all human beings. He's calling everyone to repent. Okay. Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who were Galatians? Can I show you the map? <clears throat> for those of you who are joining for the first time, you kind of need to look up here so I could explain this. This is the New Testament world. Okay, New Testament world, basically. Here is Palestine. This is Africa, Africa continent, Egypt, Tunisia, whatever, right? Africa. And this is the Mediterranean Sea, which is what the Roman Empire kind of like what is made up of. And here is Greece, here is Turkey, and here is Syria. And this city right here is uh, Antioch, Antioch Church in Acts chapter 13. And this is the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas through Cyprus, Perga, Antioch, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Do you see right here? Galatia. This is Galatia. It's a province that Rome has designated. Galatia province, Cappadocia province, Bithynia, we see in Acts chapter 16. We see Troas, and northern Greece is called Macedonia. It's, it's all in the New, New Testament. That's why I'm explaining to you so that it'll help you understand. And the southern Greece is called Achaia, and there is Athens, and there is Corinth right there. Okay? And what I'm trying to explain is who are the Galatians? Galatians are the people who are around this city. Well, Paul and Barnabas went around uh, with the first missionary journey and preached the gospel and planted a church. Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Okay, so to Paul, this is like his baby, if I may put it that way. He literally was stoned to death. Remember that in Lystra? Somebody, people came uh, and actually stoned him to death. Do you remember that? And yet he still preached and planted a church. And what happened was, and Paul and Barnabas and their missionary journey was so successful, many people came to believe in Jesus, and the churches, churches were planted. And right after they were gone, these en en enemies from Judea, Judaizers, which I'll explain next time, dogged them, followed their steps, and basically saying, no, that's not the true gospel. No, that's not the true gospel. No, that's not the true gospel. Isn't that kind of interesting? Paul says in Acts chapter 20 to Ephesian elders, after I'm gone, savage wolves will come and will tell you the lies. And so many people will just fall into it and just get out of the truth and get out of following Christ. Do you remember that? My brothers and sisters, you have one life to live and there is only one truth. And savage wolves will not leave you alone. Satan will not leave you alone. Enemy will never stop. Usually, though I think the most uh, difficult kind of fight is the truth fight inside the church, just like Galatians. Judaizers weren't like, uh, you know, enemies who basically said, I'm not Christian. But they were saying, we are Christians. They were using the language of Jesus, cross, and everything, but only difference was Jesus plus the law of Moses. Do you see the difference? Which makes it active righteousness. And that's not saving righteousness. I want to just explain one more thing before I close. Acts chapter 13, where there is a preaching of Apostle Paul, first preaching. Do you remember that preaching? Amazing preaching. And basically, Paul preached in the city of Pisidian Antioch, history of Israelites, from Abraham all the way to exile. And his point was, Jesus, now look at me, is the culmination of history. You know, Jesus is the culmination of history. Secondly, he's the fulfillment of the entire scripture. Do you remember that? And then he added to that, and he's been resurrected. But you know what? This man, 
His resurrection, according to Scripture, was written in the Old Testament. It's no surprise. He's the fulfillment of Davidic eternal covenant. He's the Messiah. So, three things. Number one, He's the culmination of history. He's the fulfillment of the Scripture. And He was resurrected. And then He summarizes everything about His first missionary journey like this. Listen to this. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, through this man, the culmination of history, fulfillment of the Scripture, resurrected Christ, through this man, forgiveness of sins may be proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes faith is justified from everything. Did you catch that? I hope you catch this. I really hope you catch this. Okay. Through him and him alone, forgiveness of sins was proclaimed to you. And by him and through him alone, everyone who believes will be justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. What did he preach? Preached passive righteousness and faith in Christ alone. That's what he preached. Now, the enemies are coming and basically saying, no, that's not enough. Jesus is not enough. You need to add this. Jesus is good, but that's not enough. Do you see what is at stake? The gospel from the Lord and your salvation is at stake. What is at stake? Your eternity is at stake. I want to just finish our first session today and hopefully it will motivate you to read Galatians, as well as the introduc introduction by Martin Luther, which I'll send it to you. Okay? It's a little long, lengthy, but it changed the course of history, of Christian history. It changed the course of his Christian history, people. Have that breakthrough happened to you? Or do you live in, I don't care, kind of stage? I want to just ask you the same question I asked you in the beginning. Can a mortal man be right before God? And the answer is yes. Yes. I think in Book of Job, that was a rhetorical question. That's impossible. But yes, in Hebrews, it says, we could approach the throne of grace with confidence. What does that sound like? Do you think that sound of confidence comes from your active righteousness? What you have done? Are you kidding me? We always try to offset, you know, my garbage and sin. But I did this. So I must be okay or better. That's what we do. That's our nature. That's why faith in Christ with, as passive righteousness is the gift of God and the divine grace of God for you to believe. I hope you, hope you understand this. Faith is a divine gift of God for you to believe. Then and only then, your career, your house, your success becomes so little compared to that. Then and only then the songs that we sing will begin to make sense to you. Then and only then. What do we have to do? Nothing. We just need to receive. If you move, you're going to ruin it. It is no longer perfect righteousness. It is no longer Christian righteousness because you are placing your faith in something else other than God's righteousness. What do we have to do? Nothing. We just need to receive. 
Let me finish with Martin Luther one more time. I think he's the, he's the star for today. Martin Luther wrote, when you are at your deathbed or in the anguish of your soul before the judgment of God and the wrath of God. And I know some of you may be, just like John Bunyan, just like the uh, Wesley brothers. You may be in anguish. You'll wonder rather seriously, is it my work, is it my life that I have done that I'll be right with God? And he goes, nay, no, no, no. That'll only bring terror and anguish in your soul in the last moment of your life. Don't live that. It is by grace, through faith of this man, and in Christ alone. And that's our righteousness. That's the Christian righteousness. Let's pray. Can you be right before God? Can you be pure before your Maker? Martin Luther seriously considered and lived in anguish for so many years. John Bunyan, seriously take this matter, took this matter and he, he lived in anguish for so many years. But the truth of the matter is most people don't even think about this. They don't care. That's how lost we are. Do you know that? That's how lost we are. We think getting $10,000 more for my salary is more important. Don't you think that? We think just look better before these people is much more important. We think, I want to get this car so bad. I want to get this house so bad. It's more important. That's how lost we are. We're lost, people. Because the truth of the matter is, you will stand before the holiness of God. You will. People think, going to church all my life. At least I go to church, we'll do it. No, no. That's your theology. Wrong theology. Wrong theology. It is so important to Paul, that's why he wrote Galatians with such vigor, such charged spirit. Because what is at stake is the gospel and your salvation. Do you, do you understand that? And Lord is opening up the door for us for the next six to eight months. And some of you may be thinking, oh, that's too long. That's too much investment. I hope you don't think that. What is six months and what is eight months of your uh, Fridays of your life? If you could be standing upon the rock of Christ. You know that song? Everything will sink. Everything will sink. Everything is sinking sand. 
only in Christ and Christ alone you can stand. You'll be able to stand. Okay, I ask you to just pray one minute. Father, we want to bless you and thank you uh, for this wonderful Lord's Day you have given us. We thank you that you have given us grace and opportunity to study this uh, magnificent gospel of Galatians. And I know you have done so much throughout history through this book. And I pray for your grace, Lord God. And I pray for your divine work among us. Only through that miraculous divine work we could have faith, Lord. It's not something, okay, I do. We need you. Only when you grant it to us as a gift that we could believe in this Christian righteousness in Christ. And I pray for your Holy Spirit to just uphold your church, Lord God, in this dark days, dark time, that you will Help this church to stand upon the truth and fight and believe and be able to share this great truth of Christ. And we commit this uh, next six months unto you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.